Hello friends, Pastor David coming to you from the beautiful chapel at Palm City Presbyterian Church. If you have your Bible handy, open it to 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'll be reading verses 1 through 5. Hear now the Word of God. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On Tuesday, June 13th, 1525, Martin Luther married Katerina von Bora. He was a former monk. She was a runaway nun. She had been sent to the convent at age five. When Reformation teaching began to spread, many monks and nuns left their cloisters and convents. In areas where the ruler favored the Reformation, this was allowed. In other areas, it was illegal. She had lived in a, in a cloister where, or I'm sorry, a, a convent where it was illegal. So Katerina, along with 11 other nuns, made a daring escape, and they ended up as refugees in Wittenberg. Because there were not many jobs for single women in those days, the usual plan was to find a suitable husband. And husbands were found for the other 11 nuns, but not for Katerina. She had fallen in love with a young man, but his parents refused to let him marry a woman who was a former nun. Another potential suitor was presented to her, but she rejected him. Finally, she confided to a friend that if she were to marry anyone, it would be Luther. Meanwhile, Luther had for a long time rejected the idea of marriage, primarily because he was an outlaw and in the eyes of Rome a heretic, and he expected to die young, burned at the stake. And what woman needs that, right? But Luther began to rethink his views on marriage. And he wrote in a letter to a friend that he might marry my Katie. And he did. The marriage was by all accounts a happy one. He was 41 and she was 26 when they married. But despite the age difference and Luther's superior education, she was every bit a match for him. They enjoyed to uh, banter back and forth and to tease each other. And on one occasion, when Luther was criticizing some radicals, she rebuked him in front of a house full of people and said that he was being too uncharitable. And Luther backed down. And we know that Luther didn't back down from popes or emperors. Marriage was an adjustment for both of them. Luther joked that he had to get used to two pigtails on the pillow beside him. On a more serious note, he sometimes got irritated when she would interrupt his studying. She would bother him to ask some unimportant question like, now what was the name of the butcher's wife again? And he would say, can't you see I'm trying to run a reformation here? But if anything, she had a steeper adjustment curve. After she married Luther, she discovered that he had not changed his bed for a year, and it was rotting from his sweat. Ew. Men, right? Ladies, I think we've been this way since, I don't know, maybe the time of Adam. Nevertheless, they got on amazingly well and deeply loved each other. Luther called her Kitty My Rib, referencing Genesis, which says that God made Eve out of Adam's rib. That, by the way, is also the reason for my sermon title today, which has to be one of the more bizarre sermon titles I have ever used. After a few years of marriage, 
Luther said, I wouldn't give up my Katy for France or for Venice. At the end of his life, he said, I shall die as one who loves and lauds marriage. Katie proved to be a capable household administrator, and their household needed administration. The Duke gave them the former cloister where Luther had lived as a monk, and they turned it into a boarding house for students and a kind of community center. They were always entertaining people. Plus, they had six children. A year after they were married, their first child, a son, Hans, was born. The next year, they had a daughter, Elizabeth, although she only lived to be seven months old and her death devastated both Luther and Katie. Then came Magdalene, Martin Jr., Paul, and Margaret. In 1542, Magdalene died when she was 13 years old, again crushing Luther and Katie. Katie ran this busy household, including raising livestock, butchering livestock, uh, keeping a fish pond, a garden, and much, much more. Katie also managed their finances because Luther was a terrible money manager, mainly because he gave money away so freely. When Luther was married, when Luther got married, it was a big deal throughout Europe. His critics said, aha, see, the whole reason behind this Reformation scam was nothing more than Luther wanting to satisfy his lust. And some of his friends worried about that kind of reaction. Now, Luther was not the first former monk and priest to get married but he was the figurehead of the movement. And this was one reason that Luther changed his mind and decided to get married. He said that his marriage would please his father, rile the Pope, make the angels laugh and the devils weep. Why? Why would his marriage make the angels laugh and the devils weep? because he would be living the truth of the gospel and setting an example of Christian freedom. To understand this, you have to realize that the medieval church had a negative view of marriage and sexual intimacy. Marriage was technically a sacrament, but everybody knew that to be holy you had to be celibate. Priests and monks and nuns all took vows of celibacy. Now, leave to the side the fact that many of them broke those vows. Clergy immorality was rampant. But the ideal was celibacy. The church thought that sex was inherently sinful, even within marriage. It was allowed if your purpose was to have children and you didn't enjoy it. Now, seriously, they thought sexual intimacy was inherently sinful. Luther saw that this, like so much else in the church of his day, was unbiblical. He pointed to Genesis, where God created a man and a woman and gave them to each other in marriage. Luther said, the lawful joining of a man and a woman is a divine ordinance and institution. Marriage is a divine kind of life because it was established by God himself. Because marriage is the good gift of our good God, it should be held in honor by all. Now beyond this question of marriage lay a deeper issue. What does a good Christian life look like? If we want to honor God with our lives, how do we do that? Vows of poverty and chastity? 
rejecting marriage and family, cutting ourselves off from the world of work and commerce? Or as Luther would have it, being joyful Christians who receive God's good gifts with thanksgiving and who try to honor God not only at church, but at home and in the workplace and in the marketplace, who try to honor God in all of life. Now this is essentially the same question our scripture reading answers. What does a holy life look like? How do we honor God? Our scripture reading comes from a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to his young protege, Timothy. Timothy was what we would call the senior pastor at the church in Ephesus. Timothy was relatively young. Ephesus was one of the great cities of the Roman Empire. It was a large, diverse city with all kinds of people and ideas and religions. Among the things Paul counseled Timothy about was false teachers. Now this was not a theoretical problem. This was something Paul had encountered many, many times in his missionary work. And the kind of false teachers he had in mind were not just people who taught false things. There were all kinds of pagan teachers and all kinds of teachers of other religions, and they were teaching false things, but they weren't pretending to be Christians. The kind of false teachers Paul had in mind were the kind who said, Jesus is great. Now let me tell you how to be a real Christian and then they perverted the gospel. So our scripture reading has two parts. In verses one through three, Paul gives us the problem. In verses four and five, he gives us the solution. Now, at the beginning, he describes a specific group of false teachers that he's worried about. And we know that he has a fairly low view of them because he said that their teaching comes from demons and that they are hypocritical liars with defective consciences. Okay, Paul, please don't hold back. Tell us what you really think. He's so negative toward them because their teachings were so spiritually dangerous. And what were these false teachers teaching? They were teaching asceticism. That is, renouncing all worldly pleasure and comfort, sometimes even necessities, in order to be spiritual or holy or to be acceptable to God. Now, why were they teaching these things? Because they believed that the physical world, the material world, is evil, and only spiritual things are good. This was a common attitude at the time, and it came from Greek philosophy, which said, well, look at the physical world all around you. It's always changing. You can't count on it. For example, your body it gets old, it wears out. Who, who needs that? It's obvious that this material stuff is inferior. It's just bad. In fact, it's evil. Only spiritual stuff is good. Your body is bad. It's like a, a prison that your soul is trapped inside. Now, because they believed this about the physical world, they forbade marriage. And in that day, that meant forbidding sex itself. Like the church in Luther's day, these false teachers thought that sexual intimacy is inherently sinful. And they also uh, required abstinence from certain foods. Now, we don't know enough about them to know exactly what their dietary restrictions were. But the important thing is that they were requiring a certain diet for religious reasons. They weren't saying, now, you should eat these foods because they're healthy and good for you, but you shouldn't eat these foods over here because they're not good for you. They weren't even saying something like, we only eat fried chicken and cornbread because that's what we like. Now, they were saying, if you want to be a spiritual person, a holy person, right with God, you must only eat whatever it was they said that you should eat. Paul points out the problem with this. 
They were rejecting good things that their good creator had given them to be enjoyed. Or as C.S. Lewis would put it later, they were trying to be more spiritual than God. C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, wrote, There is no good trying to be more spiritual than God. God never meant man to be purely a purely spiritual creature. That is why he uses material things like bread and wine to put the new life into us. We may think this rather rude and unspiritual. God does not. He invented eating. He likes matter. He invented it. Paul says that they rejected foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Now here, Paul offers a different answer to the question, what is a good life? What does a holy life look like? And he says it starts with believing and knowing the truth. Of course, he's talking about the gospel, the fact that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But he also means much more. He's talking about the whole counsel of Scripture. If you know that God is good and that he created this physical world and he called it good, then you won't call it evil. And if you know that God made us male and female and gave us marriage, you won't say that it is bad. When you know the truth, you can receive the good things that God gives with thanksgiving. In verse 4, Paul says, For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. Well, that's a strong statement. Nothing? Really? Not even say heroin? Well, obviously there are some limits. And Paul gets to that in the very next verse. He explains that. He says, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that for something to be good and holy, you must use it as God intends, and you must thank God for it. In the Gospels, Jesus declares all foods clean. So we are free as Christians to eat whatever foods we want. Our diet becomes a question of stewardship, right? Uh, how do we take care of the body God has given us? So we might put some limits on our diet for, for that reasons, for health reasons. But no food is holier than another. And our diet is, is not what puts us right with God. Likewise, sexual intimacy is holy and good within the covenant of marriage between one man and one woman. Jesus is very clear that this is God's intention and design. When we go outside that framework, we dishonor God and ourselves. As we think about how to put the Bible's teachings and Luther's example into practice, I want you to notice that our culture has the opposite problem from Luther's culture, but both problems come from the exact same error. So our culture has the opposite problem. Luther's culture pushed celibacy. Our culture pushes immorality. In our culture, anything goes. Ironically, both these problems come from the same error, namely having too low a view of sex. So, our cult Luther's culture, his church, said sex is inherently sinful. Our culture goes to the opposite extreme, but it says, well, sex is just another bodily function, like eating or sleeping. 
Now, in both cases, God says otherwise. So, our culture, God says, well, we need a higher and holier, more beautiful, biblical view of these things. So the Bible says that God created us male and female and gave us marriage for the full expression of the love between a man and a woman. In marriage, husband and wife give themselves to each other, body and soul, and become one flesh. Our culture thinks that it fails to appreciate how human sexuality is so meaningful and powerful. It is simply too meaningful and powerful to be just one more bodily function. We see our culture is stuck with that because it cuts God out of the picture. When it cuts God out of the picture, then it says we are just physical bodies. That's all we are. But if that's true, we're not even persons. All we are is aggregates of molecules randomly arranged. And deep down, we know that cannot be true. We need a higher and holier and biblical view of the human person and the human body and sex. The Bible gives us truth that we can live with. Truth that leads us to joy and contentment. May not be the easiest thing at any given moment, but unlike the alternatives, it is not a dead end. I hope you see how the Bible's view leads to joy and freedom. So the ascetics in Paul's day and in Luther's day said, don't have fun, don't enjoy life, reject the good gifts God has given, marriage, family, who knows what else, right? Now our culture comes along and goes to the other extreme, it says there are no rules, do whatever you want. But this is not freedom. This is just license to destroy ourselves. Imagine if the state abolished all traffic laws. No more speed limits, no more traffic signals, no more signs. People could do whatever they wanted behind the wheel. Would driving get better or worse? Be a nightmare. Or imagine if the government got rid of all financial laws, all banking regulations, all contract law. Would we enter a new era of financial freedom? No, within a week we'd be back to a barter economy. Nihilism is not freedom. Why would we think morals would be any different? But Christianity offers us true freedom. You have a Father in heaven who loves you. He fills this world with good things. He offers them to you. To All you have to do is use them according to His intention and thank Him for them. And then all of life becomes holy. So what does a good Christian life look like? The church in Luther's day said poverty, chastity, and obedience. Luther showed Christians a new model. Family and children and a busy household where God is worshipped. But even Luther's model is not exhaustive. You, you might be single. Jesus was. Paul was. Jesus was very clear that God calls some people to a single life. You may be married. You may have children. Maybe not. You might work in the church, as Luther did, as Paul did. But you don't have to. God might call you to some other vocation. 
Or maybe what you have is a job that just pays the bills. And that's okay. Even that could be worship if you do it for the glory of God. Luther showed the world that the good life, the holy life, is not confined to a narrow channel. His church and his culture told him, you must be celibate. But Luther broke the medieval mold. How? By listening to the Bible. His culture told him marriage and family life is less. If you want to be holy, you must be celibate. But the Bible said otherwise. And Luther saw through the lies, the false teachings of his culture by listening to the Word of God. And that is what we must do. Our culture tells us a completely different set of lies. But it too is wrong. And if we want to see through the false teachings of our day and live joyful and contented lives, then we too must listen to the Bible, which is the Word of God. Your Father in heaven loves you. He has filled this world with good things. Every one of them is an opportunity for you to honor God and find enjoyment. Every one of them is an opportunity for you to dishonor God and destroy yourself. So listen to Paul. Follow the example of Luther. Receive the good things God has given with faith and thanksgiving. Amen.